Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. Still 
touch them with the love of Christ. Um, you know, I, I just I stand in awe of all that God has done over the past five years, the many lives that have been changed. And, you know, I think of how God uses almost anything to touch and save a life around here. He'll use these silly cards that are up here on the front of this sta uh, the, the stage. He'll use people dressed in silly outfits. He'll use our small groups. He'll, he'll use just about anything. And what gets me most jazzed is when I see lives that are changed and transformed with the love of Christ, when people surrender their heart to him, when they uh, see big life change happen. You know, last night we were here and we got to celebrate the day before with our celebrate recovery community david montgomery a year sober he came and that was a huge and monumental accomplishment for him it was a wonderful thing to see and what do i mean by god will use anything let me tell you a story i hope i could do it without breaking up you know god even used this video that you saw there you see there's a young man that's part of our congregation that wasn't part of our congregation and his mom said will you help put a few pictures together for us will you help um, you know assemble these things and turn them into a little bit of a slideshow for us and he was really de-churched he was churched as a young man and he was actively involved in his faith but he had abandoned it and he he led a life of drugs and he was far from God and at the time he was putting it together he was probably still using to be completely honest with you you know and he, he said man he started putting it together and he saw all these images of people reaching out and people reaching out and people reaching out and people reaching out and God touched him and changed him and saved his life and he's he's here and he's part of our congregation and he's sober today and he's living for God again God will use anything to touch and change lives so no matter how hopeless you might feel today if you came in this room there is hope found in Jesus would you say this with me God is great his word is true and it works in my life. Do you believe that today? Amen. Then let's pray. Come on, give, yeah, give God a little bit of glory today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Father, we're gathered here on our five-year anniversary, and it seems as if we're entering into kindergarten today, Lord. These first few years have been formative, and they've not been without challenge. Father, but you've done so much already in our midst. We've witnessed so many lives changed, transformed, saved, delivered, set free. Lord, we pray that this is only the beginning, that you expand our reach and give us more opportunities to advance the kingdom of God in our backyard and beyond. Father, continue to gather together a people who are a mighty army after your heart to glorify you and lift your name on high. So this morning, as we start this new series, would you use it? As Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, would you use it to reach out to us, to remind us of how great salvation is, to remind us that we are in a war, and to remind us that our job is to advance the kingdom of God until you return. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen. Let's give God one more round of applause. He deserves so much glory for all that he's done in the life of Journey Church. So. I'm going to get right into the preaching of the word. We're starting a new series today that's going to last us pretty much all of the summer. We're going to be diving very deeply into the book of Ephesians. We don't, uh, we haven't historically done too many verse by verse, chapter by chapter studies. We did the book of John or some excerpts from the book of John last year, and it was pretty powerful and we enjoyed it. So we said, let's just go all in this year and see what God would do as we examine this particular text. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the church at Ephesus today and honestly we're going to get all of two verses into the book today I'll let you know that in the weeks ahead we are going to go about a chapter a week for the most part moving forward but I want to give you a good foundational background of what God was speaking to the churches in Asia at that time so that we can grasp what's going on and have this foundational context for the rest of the book as we move forward so you guys okay with that this morning all right, all right. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you might say, it sounds like a pretty typical greeting. In fact, this is a similar greeting to what Paul used in many of the epistles that he wrote. He used a, it was a very common one. It's actually the shortest one of the majority of the books that he wrote. If you go back to verse 1 for a second, 
second, let's start right where Paul did. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So why does he set up the text in this particular way? One, he wants you to know that he's the author. Kind of makes sense? I'm Paul. I'm writing this. And he says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. What is important about that? Being an apostle meant that he stood in the authority of Christ. So he says, the things that I am about to speak to you in this book, I come to you with the authority of God. And it says that he was appointed an apostle by Christ Jesus by the will of God. So Christ himself appointed him to be an apostle. So he didn't make it up on his own accord. He's not standing there in his own authority when he's writing these things. Historically, people have challenged Paul at times, and they've said, well, I don't believe what Paul said, right? I believe some of the other things, but I don't believe what he's writing. But what Paul is saying is he doesn't really care what you believe about him. He's saying that it is actually God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through him, that the words that he's penning in this letter are the very words of God, and he's walking in that authority. So he's putting forth this strong stance to anyone who would read this and say, okay, do you get that I'm writing in the power and authority of God. So the words that we're about to share during the course of this series come to you as words from God. This is God speaking to the church in that age, but I think he's speaking similar things to us today. You'll notice it's entitled to the saints who are in Ephesus. In the very early writings that they had, those words actually were not there. It was to the greater church, most uh, theologians believe, but it was written to the churches that were in Asia. Paul actually lived in Ephesus for three years, so he knew the area well. He knew the problems, the challenges, the state of the church. This book was written while Paul was actually in jail, and it was probably distributed to the churches that were in that region, of which Ephesus was kind of the mama church. It was the big church in the area that was birthing the other churches in that region. So shortly thereafter, when the note was written, it's believed that they directed it to Ephesus, but really it was written to a larger audience, a bit larger than just that particular city. Who was it written to? It says to the saints who are in Ephesus. So was it written to unbelievers? Y'all are pretty quiet this morning. Was it written to unbelievers? It was written to the saints. How many of you would consider yourself a saint in here today, right? Only a few of you? Come on, we got to get into this letter. We got to understand our identity. We got to dig just a little bit deeper to understand who we are in Christ. See, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. That is your new identity in Him. And that's a big part of what this letter is written about. So he's saying, I'm addressing this to the believers who are in the region. I have something to say to you who are believers in Christ Jesus and are attempting to faithfully live out the Word of God. So he's speaking to you and to I. As you continue on reading in this book, the first three chapters focus on what Christians should believe, describing the glorious riches in Christ Jesus that come by the grace gift of salvation, that you are saved by grace and grace alone, by no work of man that anyone should boast, right? That we're saved by the loving God. You didn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to lose it. Can I get an amen? Amen. Right? God just loves us and he cares for us and he picked us out of uh, a life that was leading to hell and brought us into life in Jesus' name. The last three chapters explain the implication of God's grace for the church, for individuals, and for families. And the book concludes with Ephesians chapter 6, which is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. It was very meaningful to me, especially in early Christianity. When I first got saved, I started going to a 6 a.m. Uh, morning prayer meeting that happened every Wednesday morning. I'd get up and I'd, I'd actually, we lived in Miami. I'd drive 45 minutes in the opposite direction. I worked about five minutes from where I live, but I drove 45 minutes away from church so that I could be at the prayer meeting. I'd go there and I'd pray for an hour and then I'd leave there and I'd drive all the way back about an hour with traffic to get back to work because God was stirring something in my heart in early Christianity. But I really didn't know anything, but I remember hearing about this armor of God stuff. And it sounded really cool to me. How many of you dudes like armor? Come on, you, you like the armor. I mean, so we, I, I, needed to, I needed to hear about this armor, but I didn't know where it was located in the Bible. But I heard that it was important, and I was realizing, I was starting to realize there's this spiritual battle that's going on. So I went to this prayer meeting, and with godly wisdom, there was a group of men who were there. And I got to a point in the meeting, and I said, you know, will somebody pray the armor of God on me? You know, I want to I hear about this. And he's like, 
I ain't going to do nothing for you, boy. You know, I'm not going to pray this for you. This is something you need to do for yourself. This is something you need to learn. you got to go to Ephesians chapter 6, and you got to put on the armor of God daily that you might stand. we got to gird ourselves with the word of God. I had to get this deep within me. It was something that I had to learn to do for myself. You know, somebody's not going to come put your clothes on for you every day, are they, right? we got to do it ourselves. we got to advance and, not, and sometimes just stand, as you'll see in that particular set of scripture. So it was, that was a defining moment scripture in my life. So as I said, Paul wrote this book in prison, probably around A.D. 60. A huge theme in the book is that Christians have significant spiritual blessings in Christ, and we need to live a lifestyle that reflects those blessings. We've been talking about this a lot at Journey Church over the past months, that we as believers should live these set-apart lives, that we shouldn't live and look like the world, that if we're saved, we should be living in a very different fashion than the world, that people should look at us and they should know that there's something different about us, that the scent of the world is no longer on us anymore, that we are believers in Jesus Christ. That means we're called to live holy lives, set-apart lives, that we should not be conforming to the image of this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So living this set apart life. Ephesus, the city, is mentioned 19 times in the Bible, mostly in the book of Acts. At the time it was written, the population was estimated to be about 300,000, about a third of the size of Jacksonville, but it was a powerful city. It was a big city for that day. In fact, in Asia, or what we would call modern-day Turkey, it was kind of the leading hub of economic activity. It was the place where they worshipped the goddess Diana, and one of Diana's temples is one of the ancient wonders of the world, right? So it's a beautiful city, a very sophisticated city, a wealthy city full of trade, and it was also very, very pagan. So we're going to look at that in greater detail in the weeks ahead. But let me read you a bit of a story as a way of illustrating the heartbeat of the book of Ephesians. Scientists know that ducks tend to imprint soon after birth. To imprint means that they attach themselves to the first thing that they see after they hatch, thinking that they are that thing. This is supposed to work for the duck, since when they hatch, typically the first thing that they see is the mama duck. This happens to uh, backfire occasionally. Once, for example, a duckling was hatched under the watchful eye of a motherly collie dog. The baby duck took one look at the collie and decided that the dog was its mother. It followed the collie around, ran to it for protection, slept with it at night. It spent the hot part of the day under the front porch with the collie. When the car pulled into the driveway along with the dog, the duck would run out from under the porch and start quacking viciously, trying to peck at the tires. Some things could not be changed. However, the duck still quacked. It enjoyed the water and flapped its wings. Sometimes it acted like a duck, and sometimes it acted like a dog. The author goes on to say, Christians often experience the same confusion and identity. We have been born and grown up into a fallen world, so we have learned the ways of the world. We have become like it. When we become a Christian, we are in Christ. We die to the world and are born again so that spiritually we no longer are who we once were. Too often, however, we don't see ourselves correctly. We act like the thing that we think we are rather than the thing that we really are. We believe and try to do right things, but for the life of us, we cannot exactly get it right. When we are least expecting it, a car pulls up into the driveway of our life. We explode from underneath the front porch, quacking viciously and peck at the time. So an overriding theme of the book of Ephesians becomes, who are you? Who are you? Are you that old person who you were prior to being born again? Are you something new? And as the world so imprinted on our lives that we can't shake it off. You see, the God of the universe tells us that we can, that we have a new identity in him, but we need to start to learn about that. When we become believers in Jesus Christ, it's not something that's come natural for us because we've been imprinted by the world for so long that it seems sometimes that that's the right way to live. But God's speaking to us through this text, and he's saying there is a different way to live. And Ephesians helps us to see who we truly are as Christians. You see, just as ducks are not meant to act like dogs, Christians are not meant to act like the world. Would you agree? 
The Bible in general and Ephesians more specifically spends a lot of time reminding us of who we are in him. Now, if you know me for any length of time, you'll know that I'm a pretty big fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. It helped to change my life, right? Uh, 16 years ago, next month, I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, under good godly wisdom, somebody told me that I should raise my hand, and I should get a sponsor, and I should walk into that program, and it was a great place where I might find help and hope for the addiction problem that I was suffering from. And uh, there's one thing I kind of take a little issue with in AA, uh, not enough to not go there, but there's an issue that I have where uh, every time you go in, what you're supposed to say is you introduce yourself in the following way. You say, my name is Eric and I'm an alcoholic, right? So that's the way you define yourself. Very important. I understand why they do it, especially in early sobriety. You have to come to the realization that you got an issue, right? If you're coming into those doors, you usually don't walk in there because everything's happy, joyous, and free, and you're having your best day. You walk in there because you've got an issue or somebody else looked at you and told you you've got an issue, right? So you walk in and you say, I'm Eric and I'm an alcoholic. In the early days, that was incredibly important. It, it, it resonated with me because at that point in my life, I truly was. That was what was defining me. My relationship with Christ wasn't defining me, although I was a believer at that time. My relationship with drugs and alcohol was my identity. I lived to use. I lived to wake up to, to do drugs. That was what my life had unfortunately become. So it was important to come to that realization. But now that I've been sober for some length of time, I'm no longer defined by what I was, right? I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I am a recovered alcoholic. I'm no longer an alcoholic. In fact, I've been sober longer than I even used. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, that no longer defines me. So I don't need to walk in there and necessarily say, hey, I'm, I'm Eric and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Eric and I'm a recovered alcoholic. God did something in my life. He changed me. He transformed me. I no longer have the desire to use. I no longer have the desire to drink. I no longer have a desire for those things in the world that used to entice me, right? The same analogy works for you and I because my issue is drugs and alcohol addiction. Chances are you got some issues in your life. I'll guarantee it. And if you don't think you do, then you got an even bigger issue. <laughs> See, we all have issues, some of which define us. We need to put those under the cross of Jesus Christ and start to assume this new identity as sons and daughters of the king. And we need to begin to walk in that new identity of who we really are and how God sees us, not necessarily as how we think we are. A commentator writes, and Paul tells, Paul tells the Ephesians who they have become in Christ and then prays that they might have the spiritual enlightenment to grasp who they have become. To do so is to enjoy the Christian life more completely and to live like Christ more consistently. I can't say enough about how important it is to realize where our real identity lies. Now, I shared with you that the church at Ephesus was mentioned in the Bible 19 times. It's mostly um, in the book of Acts is where you find most of those references. It's also in the book of Ephesians, obviously. There's one more place where it's referenced. Does anybody know where it's at? What you got? You guys got to speak louder. I can't hear you up here. I'm getting old and deaf. Revelations. There we go. It's in the book of Revelations, right? So what I want to do is I went through the first two verses. Today I'm going to take you to the end of the book for just a moment. And then next week we'll circle right back around and we're going to pick up in the next set of verses. Your homework for next week is going to be to read Ephesians chapter 1 because we're going to get into it quite deeply over the course of the week. So I want to read to you from, Ephes or from Revelations. I think there's some things we need to learn from Revelations in the context of the Ephesians. There's some good things that they did and some challenges that they were experiencing that we need to understand so that we don't repeat them. To the angel at the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who do evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and not, and I found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary." 
So the Bible starts out in Revelations, and God has some really good things to say about the Ephesians. He knows their works. He sees how they discern the word to such a degree that when false teachers come and begin to speak things to them, they can discern right from wrong, and they can reject those false teachings. That meant that they were in the word that they knew God's word very deeply. It was inside of them. So this is something that we should repeat as well. We should be getting our daily sustenance in God's word. We need to dig deeply into his word because guess what? In these ends of times, there's a bunch of false teachers teaching a bunch of hooey out there, and we need to be able to discern that. And then when I say dumb things, you can also help correct that in Jesus' name, right? So we need to understand the Bible enough that we don't get duped by some false teacher. Now, does that mean we need to be on a false teacher search all the time? I think every, as some people are called to that. You know, that's not my calling. There's some people that want to ferret out every false teacher and call them out. Man, that to me is not my way of living. Man, I'd rather live by the love of God and the grace of the Holy Spirit and do my thing. But some of you might be called to go after that. If it is, you know, it's a unique calling, but some people have it. So he's saying there's some things that we should commend and do well, and we speak the truth and love. And he's saying there's these great things that are going on in your life and in your fellowship, and we need to take those things to heart, and we need to apply those things in our Christianity as well. He goes on in verse 4 to challenge their faith a little bit. But I have this against you, that you abandon the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he says there's some stuff that they've got to repent from, that they're forgetting who their first love was. And I think we as believers, we often repeat this same issue that they did in their life. I was reading a book and they gave this analogy and you know, you're a new couple, you're getting ready to get married. We're gonna marry a couple this afternoon, right? You're a new couple, you're fired up and you get to that point in the wedding covenant where it says, you know, cleaving only unto you so long as we both shall live, right? Man, you, you say, I'm dedicating my life only unto you for the rest of our lives. I love you. It seems a holy and lofty goal, a wonderful thing that we should put into practice because we love them. But what if you heard that same guy the very next week right after their honeymoon was out cheating with some other girl? Would it be meaningless? You wouldn't believe it, right? You'd be shocked that one week they did it. But don't we sometimes act as adulterers and adulteresses in our relationship with Christ? See, what happens is we're these new creations, we're born again, and then all of a sudden we come up and we believe. You walk the aisle and you come up and you say, I believe in Jesus Christ. But the question is not necessarily if you believe or not, because even the demons believe and tremble is what the word says. Are you ready to follow him? You see, if you believe and you walk the aisle and the next week you go out and you start doing all the same stuff, then what is it? So the Ephesians is telling us, as we look in there, you got to live holy too, not out of some sense of the law, but out of the God of the universe changing your heart from the inside out and making those things that were once desirous to you no longer desirous to you as we submit to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we'll be exploring that in the weeks ahead. So here's what sometimes happens. Let me give you another analogy. Let's use you know, connectedness with the body. He says, you forgot to do the things that you did at first. See, when I got saved, I was radically saved, man. I mean, I was driving 45 minutes in the wrong direction so I could get my butt around men who love God who were starting to teach me what it meant to be a believer in Jesus Christ. I realized that my life was a mess and that I needed God and I had this newfound hope that was inside of me, burning inside of me. I would drive the wrong direction. I would go back. I would do anything I could to be around the fellowship of believers, to be in small groups, to be connected with the body of Christ. And my life began to change very dramatically and very radically in the right direction. I started to see God moving in my life, and I started to experience the power of God working in my life. But then even in my own life, there came a season where I started to drift. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I started to fall away a little bit from those things, and some of the stuff that was important to me suddenly didn't seem so important to me anymore. And maybe I picked up alcohol for the first time in a long time after sobriety, and then all of a sudden, I found myself drinking on a daily basis, and then since I'm drinking, it's okay to use drugs. You see where that pattern starts to lead? And even as a believer, four years into that, I actually had to go to treatment four years after becoming a believer in Jesus Christ because I forgot the things that I did at first which stole my first love. 
Let me give you another analogy, may, or two things, I guess, that I would speak to you. Some of you didn't have the same kind of radical transformation that I did, and that is perfectly okay. I wish that was my story, to be honest with you, that you grew up and, man, you lived for him most of your life and you haven't done anything wrong or stupid in a big sense. But the Bible says that even on your best day, apart from him, you are still filthy rags. And sometimes that turns into a pride in your life that he's even more evil and more conceited than anything that that other person could have ever done. So you got to be careful in both regards. Let me give you one final analogy today. Here's what we often see happening, and this is what I think is a huge cause at times of, of the phone calls that we get, and we do get many. You know, what, what happens, and I gave a little bit of analogy of this last week, is say, man, you're faithfully attending church, you're fired up for God, you're living for Him, you're coming on a weekly basis, you're doing all those things that I told you about, you're serving, you're giving, you're loving, you're hanging out with other believers, man, your life is on track, your life is fired up, and then all of a sudden, one Sunday morning, you get this notion, I'm going to stay sitting in the bed, right? I had a busy week, you know, it's all good, so the next week, Okay, man, I didn't go to church last week, but I'm going to go this week. So you go to church, right? And then the next time comes around and that alarm goes off and you're like, man, it felt pretty good two weeks ago. Didn't I get so much accomplished around the house? Man, it was raining. I didn't get to accomplish all the things that I needed, but that day I got all this stuff accomplished. So you don't go to church that day, right? And then all of a sudden the next week rolls around and you don't go to church that week either. And then all of a sudden, those groups where you were connected to and you're serving with other believers, and maybe it's small group season like we have right now, and eh, I don't need to go to small group tonight, right? And then all of a sudden, I'll just pick on the guys so that that week, all of a sudden, you're there, and the mail comes in that week, and it's the Victoria's Secret Swimsuit Edition. Not, well, I got that wrong. They don't have a swimsuit edition, do they? I'm thinking the ESPN summer <laughs> see, sports. See, Don gets Sports Illustrated to his house. Pray for that boy. <laughs> So you get Sports Illustrated to your mailbox because you like sports, not because of the swimsuit edition, right? But <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> so, back to my analogy. Swimsuit edition comes in, right? So you start reading the swimsuit edition. Ooh, man, they, they look fit. You see how ripped that girl is? Ooh, hallelujah. Then all of a sudden... The next day you go out and you get the mail, but this time it's the Victoria's Secret catalog coming for your wife. And you picked up, man, the sw swimsuit edition wasn't so bad. I'm going to check me out the Victoria's Secret thing. And all of a sudden you start looking at the Victoria's Secret catalog, and then somehow those things that were once not acceptable to you because you were fired up for Christ, you might find yourself back at the computer and then you're looking at internet porn. And then maybe you're sitting at the computer and one of those Facebook messages goes, pop. And it's one of those old flames that you had, right? And before, when you were fired up for God, there's no way you would go and start to chat back with them. But all of a sudden, you find yourself in the chat room. You find yourself talking with them. And maybe you go out and you physically meet them. And then you go to places that you never would have gone when you were connected, when you were focused on your first love. See, we have these built-in forgetters as human beings where we revert back to our duck-like activity. We go back and we start to act like and talk like and quack like the world again. And he's reminding us in the book of Ephesians so much so that when you get to the book of Revelations, he's telling you, you guys got to get this. He's saying, don't fall back. Don't go back to your old ways. Remember who you are. Remember the things that you did at first that got you to where you are, lest you forget and slip back into those habits of old. So this summer, I want to say, and I'm proud to see so many people here this morning, like I said, especially after last night when there was this craziness here last night, I'm here to tell you that don't take a break for the summer. Because what happens is you might get in a habit that, man, you get to that end of the summer and you think it's school time and it's time to plug back in and you're not going to plug in and you might be out there doing things you never could have imagined. He's saying, don't forget your first love. Don't forget the things that got you where you're at. At Journey Church, we're not taking a break this summer. We are on an advance 
this summer. We're going to advance the kingdom of God over the summer. We're going to plug in. we got a lot of wonderful events that are just fun that you don't have to do anything but show up to and just have a great time so that we can connect with one another and love on one another and build healthy, life-giving relationships that sustain us so that we can grow in Him. We have 46 different small groups that started last weekend. It's not too late. Go out there to the lobby, pick up one of those groups directories that's out there if you weren't here last week or go online to journeychurch.org click on get connected groups and you'll see all the list out there where you could get connected as well don't fall back into those patterns of old because what happens is you finally get to this place you're like where did I get to how did I get back to this place where I never wanted to go and your sin begins to enslave you again and you don't feel like there's a way out but let me tell you there's always hope what was the last word that he said What's the hope? What's the answer? It's a word we don't like to say too often. He said, repent and turn from your ways and turn back to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes today? If you're here today in your relationship with Christ, it seems like a distant memory. If the joys and encouragement that you once had in fellowshipping with the saints seem so far away, the joys that you had in serving and make a difference seem long gone, You had a taste of it. You remember what it was like. It was sweet and it was good being in deep communion with God and with other believers. See, there's another saying in AA. If you get into AA, they they jokingly say, it'll mess up your getting high. Because you've had a taste of the good life. You've had a taste of what it's like to live apart from that. And when you return back to it, it sickens you. And that's how sin is. Maybe you've never had a relationship with Christ and you've been living for the world and you haven't seen any problem in that. But today, God is convicting and touching your heart and he's saying, man, I want to welcome you into my family, into the family of God. I love you enough that I died for you. So we're here today because God wants to reconcile people unto himself. That's what we've been about for the past five years and that's what we're going to be about until Christ returns, seeing people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and living for him all the days of their life. So, Father, as we try to grasp the words that were shared from the book of Ephesians and Revelation today, would you make them alive in our hearts and our minds? So here's what I want to do, man. If you're here today and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God today, you know, we want to give you that opportunity. We're not going to do anything weird. We're not going to make you stand out in any crazy way. In fact, nobody's even looking right now. But I'd like to pray for you right where you're at. Would you do me a favor if that's you? Raise your hand up high and I'll pray for you. You here today? I see your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for moving. We thank you for touching lives. We thank you for those who stepped out in faith and raised their hand today. I don't know if this is the first time they've done it or and maybe they are believers. Their salvation is secured, but they're not living the kind of life that you would have for them, and they realize it. And they've come to that point where they're heeding the words that are found in Revelation that goes on to say, He who has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, let them put it into practice. So, Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear today that you are Jesus, the Son of the living God. When we come to you, we are born again. We are forgiven. We are set free by the work that you did on Calvary's cross. And today we appropriate that into our lives. It was already done. Our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Should we remember the past? Yes, lest we forget it and go back to it, Lord God. But we are set free. We are no longer bound by the identity of this world. We're no longer bound by the things of this world. Our new identity is found in you, forgiven, loved, children, sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us walk in that. Let us walk in the joy of our salvation. Let us remember the things that we did at first when we were fired up for you. Let us revisit those times and those seasons, not just for the feeling of it, but that we would just get intimately renewed and in love with you. Lord, we honor you and we praise you this morning. We give you all the glory. You are Jesus, the son of the living God. And everybody says, Amen and amen. Would you put your hands together for those who raised their hands and you have a connection card with you, fill that out. We'd love to get you some more information on how to start your walk of faith off in a great way. A great next step would be to pick up a small groups guide and go get plugged in. I have one last task for you before we go. You know, one of the things that we did that got Journey off the ground that really helped start to lay the groundwork was all these crazy little cards that you see up here. And I've got different ones with different meanings about different events and things that we have coming up. And 
I believe in them wholeheartedly because God used one of those cards to touch my life and lead me into church and lead me into a place where I ultimately got saved. And I would challenge you today, as you leave, maybe swing by the front, grab a few of these, give them out during the course of the week. Let somebody know that God loves them this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he give you peace in Jesus' name. Live your lives to make a difference in the lives of others. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us here for one of our inspiring messages at Journey Church. If you live in the greater Jacksonville area, we want to invite you to come out to one of our weekend experiences. Our service times are Saturday night at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 a.m., or 11 15 a.m. or if you would like to you can join us online at any time watching any of our services live at journeychurch.org we look forward to seeing you next time